Thank you, Warren, and good morning. Warren, you are a leader in my life, believe me. Thank you. Uh, we are in uh, the 24th chapter of the book of Proverbs, and we are doing the sayings of the wise. Uh, this is saying number 30 today, beginning in verse 21 and 22. And then we're going to move to a new section of a, a further sayings. And we will only be doing three of those because they are, the rest are rather redundant for the, the Proverbs that we have already covered. And that will move us all the way into chapter 25. And we want to do the first three if we have enough time this morning. So, chapter 24, saying number 30, beginning in verse 21. I fear the Lord, my son, and the king, with rebellious officials, do not be involved. Because disaster from them suddenly... Now, there is this word uh, appears... That may be your, your translation. It is actually the same word to rise that we had in verse 16. That if the righteous man is knocked down, he rises seven times. And that word is the supernatural life. God's plan brings the righteous man back. So he's never defeated in the campaigns of life. And that is this word. So because disaster from them suddenly appears, that is God doing it. And who knows the ruin the two of them can inflict. So that would be both the Lord and the King Himself. And then we enter into uh, this new section uh, beginning in verse uh, 23 called the further sayings of the wise. There are also sayings of the wise, verse 24, to show. Now, the King James translates this as respect in delivering or giving a verdict to the guilty and pronouncing them as innocent people. And the result of that, the proverb says, people will curse them. Communities will strike them with a curse. Verse 25, those who establish what is right, it will be pleasant. Now, you may have delighted or delight but it's actually the word pleasant, and I'm going to show you how it is used and where it's used, and you will never forget it ever again. So it will be pleasant on them, and it will come or bring a blessing that is good. You know, we talk about the consequences of wickedness in the book of Proverbs. Well, here's the consequences of a righteous life, a good life, a profound life in the light. And good is going to come to that individual, that person, as a result. Here's chapter 25, a new chapter altogether. We're flying through this book. Look at this, chapter 25 already. Uh, verse 1, these are the Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied and collected. Verse 2, the glory of God is to hide a matter, but the glory of a king is to search out a matter. What a profound proverb that is. And then verse 3, as for the heavens with the height and the earth with reference to the depth is the heart of a king. For there is no searching out 
of him. What an interesting proverb that is. Well, here is our exposition this morning, beginning in chapter 24, beginning in verse uh, 21 and 22, making up the 30th saying of the wise. Fear the Lord, my son. It's an opening command. It's the theme of the book, the fear of the Lord's the beginning of wisdom. And it is the Old Testament version of what you and I would call our personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It is, that is the fear of the Lord. It is an attitude. It is a life. It is a number of things that affect our daily walk, our decisions, all that we do and make. That is the fear of the Lord from the Old Testament. Thus, one is all the time in submission and in all places submissive to Him, the invisible Lord and Master. But also, look what the proverb says, and equally to the King. Now, that needs to be fleshed out a little bit. A couple of things that we learn uh, in the Old Testament regarding the king. First of all, David taught us that he was the Lord's anointed, which means he was specially selected in time and space to be the living representative of God. So to make war on the king was to make war on God. He was his vice regent in the world. And as long as he followed the Word of God, as long as he followed the Scriptures and was faithful to them, God would defeat his enemies. The promises were always with him as long as he was obedient to the law. So, that is the king, the Lord's anointing, the selected agent, the vice regent on the earth. Now, look at the direct application to us as believers. 1 Peter 2.17, fear God, honor the king. So that's what we do as believers. Dr. Johnson made a, a, a big point out of this to students of his that Christians, believers, can live under any form of government that the world has ever created. We are always good citizens of every political stripe and every political philosophy. We don't blend in. We are just subservient to it because it was given to us in the providence of God. But when the government, when the government goes outside of the Word of God, then we have a problem. Then we are different about that in life and in attitude. Here's verse 22. It gives us the reason for not being a rebellious dissenter with people of rank and honor. Because disaster from them suddenly appears uh, or rises. And who knows? So our top line, the proverb says disaster. Line two says ruin. Those, uh, that's the parallelism. This is bad things that are going to happen to this individual. And it can come says the proverb from divine providence itself. Let's think about that for a moment. How about Haman in the book of Esther? Look at all the invisible providences that worked against that high official. It was the sovereignty of God, and yet God was never mentioned. It was silent providence working always for his destruction, the house of Haman in Esther. Or it can come from the magistrate himself. 
David's counsel to Solomon. 1 Kings chapter 2, he says to his son, deal out capital punishment to those who would trouble your kingdom. That's 1 Kings 2.9. And he is giving his son counsel when he takes over as king. He says, do not consider them innocent. That would be a that would be called righteous in Israel. They are not righteous. They were troublemakers to me, and they will be troublemakers to you. Deal with them. Deal with them harshly. He says, you're a man of wisdom. You will know what to do. Now, line one says, suddenly appears. This word suddenly. Uh, we had this word in Proverbs chapter 6 in verse 15. It was the fool who gestured with his hands, with his feet. It was signs of arrogance in Israel and in the ancient Near East. And this kind of man, the proverb said, stirs up conflict all the time. But here is the consequences to that in the wise saying, look, disaster is going to overtake him in an instant. How do we know that? That's the word suddenly. He's going to be destroyed without remedy. When I think of suddenly, I think of the supernatural. I always think first and foremost when I see suddenly in the Bible of Acts chapter 2 and verse 2. Because that's how the text begins. And suddenly... You know, here we are on Solomon's portico and there is this rush of wind that comes from above. And so the Spirit of God took the wind as a physical expression of His presence and then He lit tongues of fire, flames over the head so that men could visibly see that something had just happened with great drama. That's... This word, suddenly, without expectation, without anticipation, like the seemingly random arrow launched into the sky without, with measure, precisely, in time, in length, and it struck King Ahab in the chest while he was in his chariot. That's 1 Kings 22.34. Seemingly out of nowhere. And here comes this arrow. Line two. Now see, when we read the Proverbs, every word is so essential. You see that? Who knows? Those two words are found together in the Old Testament ten times. Ten times. Five times outside of lit wisdom literature. Who knows means outside of wisdom literature that the possibility is Something good is going to come from this. And here's the classic text of who knows. It's Esther chapter 4 and verse 14. Mordecai says to Esther, and who knows? Who knows? Whether you have not come into the kingdom for a time such as this. So it's all the possibility of positive providence. But outside of wisdom, but out inside of wisdom literature, now we're into the, the Psalms, the Ecclesiastes, the Proverbs, Job. That's wisdom literature in the Bible. When who knows occurs in wisdom literature, bad things are on the way. There's a bad moon rising for the fool, for the wicked. So, that's line two. Bad news. Foolish behavior. Consequences. Either way, the sovereignty of God, invisibly or through the King, will deal with foolishness, which is wickedness in the Old Testament. Now, we come to a new collection of sayings. Proverbs 24, beginning in verse 
23, and it actually runs to verse 34. It's called Further Sayings of the Wise. These are also sayings of the wise. Now, this is like the beginning of the sayings back in 2217. We had a prologue where the son was motivated to hear. For all these wise sayings, ears need to be made attentive. But that's a supernatural work, isn't it? For you to suddenly hear the Scriptures. You may have heard them for many times. But now, at this particular time, you hear. And your mind is attentive. That's supernatural. So beginning in verse 23, not a prologue like we had in verses 1-7, through Proverbs chapter 1, describing what wisdom's functions are and do. This is just a superscript called a superscription. What does that mean? They are always over many of the Psalms. And all you have is a reference to a Psalm of David or of David or perhaps a historic setting. This occurred when David was in the cave and so forth. Now, why do we reverence the superscripts? We reverence the superscriptions because they are verse 1 in the inspired language. So we treat them as Holy Scripture. Although they're not really informative other than giving us a rather bland description of things. But we treat them as Holy Scripture. Now, notice the former sayings have now been added to sayings we have a particle of addition here in the inspired language. So, we have the word also. You may have that. And or also. That's the idea. Now, this word was passed down orally in the home. So, it's not called Scripture yet. These were just what men on the street knew and shared with one another. Wisdom. Now, line two pertains to the theme of giving a fair, objective, just verdict. In giving a, a verdict to show partiality, the King James says respect. The word means to inspect, to look over. I'm going to give you this word and you'll never forget it. It occurs... In Genesis chapter 31 and verse 32, Jacob is fleeing Laban. He's going back under the counsel of God to the land that he's promised. And Laban catches up with him. And Laban wants to kill him. And he wants to take everything. But God says, don't you lay a hand on him. So Laban catches up with him. He's furious. And he's got to have some reason for his anger. So he says, well, you stole all my gods. All my little gods you've stolen. And so Jacob uses this word with Laban. Genesis 31-32, Jacob says to Laban, go, look over, inspect, examine all the tents. See if you can find your God. That's his word. So, when it's used in regards to a verdict, it's a very bad thing. Let me give you one other use of it because you already know it. Remember, we've talked over and over about favor. Favor comes from above. You can't earn favor. Favor is given by God. You say, for some reason, this person liked me. For some reason, this door opened for me. For some reason, for some, well, it was because God worked favor in that individual's heart. You see it in the Scriptures in the Old Testament called favor. Here's your normative text. We've referred to it many times. You already know it. Ruth chapter 2 and verse 10. Ruth asked Boaz, why have I gained favor in your eyes that you should? Now, here is our word from Proverbs 24. And 23, that you would take notice, examine, like examining the tents 
of Jacob looking for gods. When it's in conjunction with a verdict or giving a verdict, that's bad. Because that means the fix is in. The prophets tell us that Messiah is going to bring a just verdict. That is the famous Old Testament word, justice. And Messiah will bring justice to the world. He doesn't have to build a consensus. He doesn't have to get people on the phone and say, I think that this and this. No. He will know instantly what is right and what is wrong. That is the justice that we are to expect from the Messiah. When you have this examination next to justice, it means that there's nothing fair about it. Otto Warbeer, he was, uh, he was in the Korean courts, remember? And he got an unjust verdict. And that's not good. Here's the full explanation of that. Verse 24, for anyone who says to the guilty, you're innocent, people will curse him. Communities will strike him with a curse. Now, notice the top line uses the word guilty. That would be a pronouncement in Israel of guilt. A hammer comes down, you are declared guilty. And, but the proverb talks about a person being set free. You see that? If you are set free, you're declared innocent in Israel. And that's the pronouncement of righteousness upon the unrighteous. That was Barabbas. He was released. Set free. He's declared righteous. Look at sayings. They are now making this public and upon the speaker himself. So we ask the question, what is the motive for doing something? Why would you do something like that? Well, here's why. You disadvantage the community because you're advantaged. So I'm disadvantaging the community to help myself. That's why I do it. That's why I declare this person and that person, this organization, that organ, they're, they're free. They're free. That band over the eyes of Lady Justice, she's looking, she doesn't have a band, bandage over those eyes. She sees clearly. And these officials are meeting out injustice in the land. And as a result, look, notice peoples is in the plural. Don't miss that. This is the local community, city of Dallas. This is, this is the state, Texas. This is nationally. This is what we all say to one another. There is injustice in the courts of North Korea. Now, in the ancient Near East, and particularly in Israel, curse is used. And here's what you need to understand about a curse. I curse you. And the Scripture says, that comes out of my mouth and it falls to the ground. It evaporates. Nothing happens. But this is not that kind of curse. This kind of curse is where we have looked for justice and got none. We have looked for righteousness and it's not there. And so what do we do? We call out to God for justice and equity and fairness. 
The morning of the Murrow City bombing in Oklahoma City, I told you I was two blocks away. I just pulled into the parking garage. The jolt was so great, it threw me against the steering wheel. I thought someone had rear-ended me. And then when I got home later that morning, and the enormity of what had just taken place, taking the front of that federal building off and putting it into the street. And then you remember the pictures from all the magazine. The, there were the firefighters carrying the bloody child dead down the street to an ambulance. The enormity of all that gripped me. And I remember, I went back to my study, I got down on my knees, and I said, Oh, God, God, find this person or these people that did this. Let them not escape. I remember that as clear as a day. And you know, if Timothy McVeigh had gone out the northwest side of town and just stopped at the stoplights and the, the, the stop signs and moseyed on out to the northwest part of town, caught the farm roads and made his way through the little towns and communities all the way up into Colorado, he would never have been caught. But what did he do? He jumped out on I-35 he was going 100 miles an hour and he had no car tag. Hello? Hello? Highway patrol, can you see me here? And this highway patrolman pulls him over. And one thing leads to another and to another and to another. And suddenly he's arrested. And that night, this highway patrolman was a Christian and began to weep on television that God, he said, would allow me to find this man. He was humble. He was broken. That's the answer to the prayer. So here's 25. Those who establish what is right, it will be pleasant. Your translation may have delight. Here it is. It is pleasant. This is the word that's used in 2 Samuel 1.23. David writing the funeral of Saul and his son Jonathan. And he said they were beloved and pleasant. Here it is again. Psalm 133. David says, how good and how pleasant it is when God's people are together in unity. The word pleasant means unity. We are all gathered together in a common bond. That's the idea of the word. And then on them, that is the blessings that are coming. We've gone through a hot summer in Dallas. We see the dark clouds rolling in. We can smell the rain in the air. We have anticipation. We hear the thunder. And it is about to shower down upon us. And that's what God will bring to the righteous. Look, will come. You see that? That's future certainty. It's blessings, power, potency. Now look at this ending. He brings good. It is He. Not men. It is He. Your manna comes from above. Blessings come from above. Now, here we are in 25 verses 1, 2, and 3. These are the Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied and collected. Another collection of Solomon's Proverbs. It suggests that we have an editor putting together this collection. It's like an appendices. And uh, this is added to the other collection that we've had. The top line. Notice the words, the men of. Now, you wouldn't think that was important, would you? It's vitally important. It speaks to the integrity of the text. 1 Samuel 23.3 The men of David. What does that mean? If you are close to David, 
You have David's ethics. You have David's thinking. You are one and the same with David. Remember, the Malachite comes into the camp. He proclaims the death of Saul. And what did his men do? They rent their clothes. They wept because they had been with David. They bought into David's values. That's the idea. And so here it is. Hezekiah, the king of Judah, the reign is, remember we're counting the clock down, 715 to 686. Meaning, the Lord has become my strength. And so, this word copied and collected means to advance. We're moving His writings forward. 1 Kings 4.32, He spoke 3,000 Proverbs. He wrote 1,500 songs. What an incredible mind. What a gift. That's more than Lennon, McCarthy, uh, Paul Simon. Mix them all together. They can't write that many songs. This man did. Now, look at this. Proverb. So interesting. God hides kings search out. You see that? God's world is full of conundrums and puzzles. They said when Boris... When, when Bobby Fischer beat Boris Spassky in chess, that the deciding game that Bobby Fischer did something that had never occurred in the game of chess ever. And men have studied it to this day. It is thinking on a different level. And that's why Spassky, when he finally... Figured it out. Remember, he just pulled back his chair and he just began to clap. So brilliant. Men try to understand that and they can't. Now, I want to show you. Our proverb declares that God has His secrets and at His time, He reveals them. That's very interesting. Uh, 1 Kings 19, um, Elijah, the prophet of fire and thunder, he thought he was the only one that was standing against Ahab, Jezebel, and all the priests of Baal. But God said, no, surprise, I've got 7,000. He didn't know that. He told him when he was ready to tell him. But now, I want you to see probably one of the greatest bait and switch stories in all of world history. It occurs, it occurs when Israel leaves Egypt. And remember, they go out into the Midian desert and the address that they headed for is a place called Piharoth between Migdal and the sea. And from every appearance, structurally, it's the stupidest thing they could do. Pharaoh heard that and he said, well, they don't know what they're doing. They're out of control. They're a 13-year-old in a Formula One race car. But God had a plan. He revealed His plan to Moses. Here it is. Exodus 14.4 For my own glory, He says, I'm going to harden the Pharaoh's heart. He's going to pursue. You see Proverbs 21.1, the king's heart is in the hands of the Lord. He directs it like a water course. So Pharaoh's going to pursue. And the text of Scripture, God says, I'm going to gain honor for myself in this. And, e and the purpose of that is that Egypt is going to know they are going to learn the name of the burning bush. Me. I am. They're going to learn it. It ties back to Exodus 5.2. You could just draw a straight line across the pages of Scripture. That's where God told Moses and Aaron, when you stand before Pharaoh, here's what you're to say. Thus saith the Lord, let my people go. Remember how he answered? I don't know the Lord. I don't know Him that I should let you go? My friends, <laughs> that is the mind. That is the mind of the unregenerate man that does not have the Spirit of God. That's what Paul says 
in, a, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. That it's foolishness to him. So, Pharaoh, you ask, who is the Lord? Well, his revelation declares who he is. Let's feed on it for a moment. Psalm 24, who is the Lord? He is the one that's called strong. He is the one called mighty in battle. He is the Lord Almighty. He is described as the King of glory. And so Pharaoh, who is he? Here he is. He is the King of glory. And you're just a common man, born in privilege. And you think more highly of yourself than you should. See, glory is reality. Glory gives us perspective. And there's never, no better illustration of that than the shepherds keeping watch at night. Now when I say night, there, you have the moon, the luminaries, but out there you have no electricity. You can't see your hand in front of your face. Think of the profundity of this moment. God opens the sky with the shepherds that are guarding the sheep at night. And suddenly, with it opening, it's like 10,000 LED lights in a concentrated era. And the Scripture says those shepherds were terrified. We all would be terrified. And the Scriptures say the glory of God shone around them. Perspective. Look at the brilliance of what he just did. Better than Bobby Fisher on a chessboard. He lights up the darkness. He tells men on a night shift in the darkness, follow the light. Here's the light. Here's the reality. You'll find a babe. And here's the pronouncement of all the ages. The one who broke, who crushes the head of the serpent, he will be the babe in the manger. God has come down and he is now among us. The glory of God is so practical, it's so relevant. You wouldn't think that, would you? Back in the 50s and all through the 60s, the big name on the European continent was a man by the name of Rudolf Bultmann. He was in great demand. And Rudolf Bultmann said that you don't start with theology proper, the communicable attributes of God and the incommunicable, the names of God, the essence of God. You don't start there. You start with anthropology. So rather than theology proper, we substitute that for anthropology. Now, if that's the case, I would like to ask his white-collared and robe-wearing followers this question. Why in Acts chapter 7, when Stephen was asked to give a full defense of the Gospel from the Old Testament forward to the High Court of Israel, the Sanhedrin of Jerusalem, the experts in the Law and the Prophets, did he begin that presentation, Acts chapter 7 and verse 2, with these words, the God of glory. High, heavy, far above mortal man. And that's his starting point. That's where his beginning was. And you know what? That's your beginning too. Paul tells you that in Ephesians chapter 1. You were elected before the foundation of the world, but verse 6, he gives you the reason for the praise of his glory. So you're significant. You're relevant. You don't just blend in. No, you're a blinding light to a crooked and dark generation. That's what's happening with you. And so, in coming to a place like this, 
Believer's Chapel, Dallas, Texas, 2022. We start here, Believer's Chapel, with the glory of God. That's our starting point. That's, that's what gives you relevance. It explains your past. Remember Paul on Mars Hill, Acts 17? It explains your past, your family, where you were born, where you came from. God has determined, He said to these philosophers, the times and the places that all men would live. Pretty relevant. How about this for relevance? Where you're sitting this morning and what you have on your lap, the Word of God. Let me explain it to you this way. When you were dozing off last night, how'd you sleep? Did you catch yourself and say, wait, wait a minute, I've got to keep my heart beating. Now, I've got to keep that heart beating. You didn't do that. And when you were in deep sleep and unconscious, how'd you keep those lungs filled with air? Did you do that? You see, Paul explains it this way. In Him we live and move and have our being. So in coming to this Sunday school class this morning, here's the God of glory. And He's revealed. In Exodus 34, He summons Moses up to the mountain. And the Scriptures say that He was put in a state of unbelievable tranquility. Because the Scripture says He doesn't eat, He doesn't drink. He's there 40 days and 40 nights. And the only thing that we know about that event is that God said, now, here is My Word. Take down the words of God. And when Moses came off that mountain, you remember the story? His face shone. Could you turn around when you're talking to me? And he had to put a veil on his face. What's the touch point of reality to you and me to that event? It's only one thing. It's the Word of God. When you open this revelation, God is changing you. He is transforming you down those creases of your brain, roll the Word of the living God and kicking out all of that sludge that the world gave you. And now you're thinking differently and now you're acting differently because the proverb says, as a man thinks, so he is. The glory of God is so relevant. It's so practical. And it's our starting point. Now, I'm, I'm a visitor. You know, I come in town, I teach, and I hear things. People say things to me that they probably wouldn't say to you. Oh, Believer's Chapel, Believer's Chapel, yeah. I used to go to Believer's Chapel. Oh, it's a great place to learn the Word. But, but you know, we moved on. And I, I say, moved on to what? Move on to what? My friends, when you find the Word of God and men who can teach it, you found the gold nugget of life. That's Believer's Chapel, Dallas, Texas, 2022. Praise be to God for the glory of God. Now that's your introduction. And I'm out of time. Next time, we'll get into the proverb itself. Let's close in a word of prayer. Thank You, Father, for our time of study this morning. Thank You for this church, for the elders, the deacons, and all that it represents in this city, in this state, in this country of ours who begin in this place with the glory of God. 
It's what changes us. It's what gives us purpose and meaning for our day. And we praise You for it. This is why we're here. This is why we're before You. This is why the Word is speaking to us. And we give You praise for that. In Jesus' name, Amen.